I don't know if there is a horror game that exists that would stick with you the same way Silent Hill 2 does. Many rate this as one of the greatest, if not the greatest horror game to have ever been made. And with good reason, the idea that your horrors can stem from internal manifestations over the rule of observation and scary deliveries is something that stuck with gamers who played this game when it first released on the PS2. But to me, Silent Hill 2 represents far more than just a game where your enemies are your own and are demons. It represents a deep dive into the tragic outcomes of three entirely different protagonists who have been drawn to the town through trauma, guilt, and their own self-inflicted weaknesses. So join me, let's go through it together. We're going to break down every detail we possibly can find in this game to understand its protagonists, its story, its design and philosophy. And naturally, I will be your guide. Let's travel through the deserted town of Silent Hill and together we can find out why it stands heads and shoulders above its competition all these years later. Silent Hill 2 opens with our protagonist looking at himself in the mirror. He touches his face in order to confirm that what he is experiencing isn't a dream. He seems to be in a public toilet near the entrance of the town. He takes a deep breath and asks the question. Uh, Mary, could you really be in this town? We leave this place, but not before taking note of a few hidden details, after which James himself gives you some insight as to why he's come to the town. His wife, Mary, passed away due to an unknown illness three years ago, yet he received a mysterious letter saying to come to the town of Silent Hill. This letter was signed by Mary and in her handwriting as well, which prompts him to then make his way there. She has asked him to meet her in this special place, which to James means a myriad of different locations within the town. With that in mind, we make our way in, ready to discover the horrors that await us. This is a good time to talk about the artistic choices that were carried over from the previous game. For a start, the game still runs using fixed camera angles, which I think for this kind of game is the best choice, as it provides you with a better indication of what's in your environment and frames the gameplay sequences the way they are intended to be. The fog of course makes its return and whilst it was used to cover up the limitations of the PS1, it's kept here to make sure you are wary of every step you make. Games like GTA had already demonstrated that the PS2 was capable of achieving larger draw distance Instances, but the open-ended claustrophobia is an intentional design choice. After all, like I said previously, your fear isn't what you can't see, it's that you don't know what's in the fog with you. As uh, <laughs> mentioned before, James' actual run cycle is a tad funny to me, but I think what actually bugs me the most is the way his arms move. Mind you, it wasn't much better in Silent Hill 1, but its polygonal graphical style kind of excused the animation limitations. The PS2 had already proved more than capable of handling run cycles that were far more human? Realistic? I don't know, it bugs the shit out of me though. Luckily, the rest of the game, from a graphical perspective, doesn't suffer from this flaw. The game is packed with detail from start to finish, with every section feeling eerie, abandoned and properly lived in. The town itself starts to feel like it's taking on personalities of its own when you start to uncover more of the story, as if the game is leading you towards conclusions about the story elements as you start to progress. There is a great example of this a little later on, and trust me, I intend to point it out as it blew my mind when I discovered it. Whilst the in-game engine has seen a massive improvement, both in the presentation and its animation, I think where the graphics really excel are the FMV sequences. These boast animations that, even by today's standards, are full of expression and intricacy. Every movement each character makes within these FMVs is believable, realistic, and human in every way possible. Where it especially excels is with the facial movements themselves, feeling ever expressive as the characters start to portray a wide variety of emotions, providing the appropriate ambience for each scene and showcasing higher graphical fidelity than most of its peers. Your further exploration of the outskirts of the town leads you to both a save point and our first character interaction. When you first interact with the save point, James mentions that it starts to cause his head to hurt. There is a reason for this, but uh, I'll tell you later. <laughs> Your first character interaction takes place in a graveyard and you meet the first other protagonist of this game. This is Angela, and on first glance she doesn't seem very alert or aware of what's going on around her. Interactions with her come off as awkward to start. 
her claim being that she has come to the town searching for her mother. But the lack of faith in her voice as she tells you this is indicative of something beneath the surface. And this plays in a lot later in the game. However, for now, it serves as insight as how these characters are going to interact with one another moving forward. She is hesitant to speak to James, professing that she isn't lying about the town being dangerous. James, of course, says he doesn't care. There's something wrong with it. It's kind of hard to explain, but... Is it dangerous? Maybe. And it's not just the fog, either. Okay, it's... I got it. I'll be careful. I'm not lying. No, I believe you. It's just... I guess I really don't care if it's dangerous or not. I'm going to town either way. We get our first insight into James here, where he seems to be struggling to find any purpose in living after the death of his wife. We know here that his wife is the centre of his universe, and without her, he is willing to walk into a mysterious town on the off chance that she just might be alive. And this is despite seeing her die three years earlier. I'm not an expert on mental health, and so will not comment on that any further. But his lack of care regarding the situation he is, and will soon find himself in, shows the inner struggle right from the get-go. Your interaction with Angela complete. You make your way into the town. Your entry into the town greatly mirrors the first game. You stumble upon what appears to be a trail of blood on the ground, after which you notice a figure, for lack of a better term, glitching in the fog. You follow the figure into a secluded area where you get your first taste of the horrors that await you. The difference here is that the game takes this chance to introduce you to combat, where Silent Hill 1 did not. It isn't a massive departure from the systems of old, and you may even find that James is less agile than our previous protagonist. The radio mechanic also makes its return here too, serving as a warning sign for potential enemies that would be lurking in the area, as well as something to drive the plot forward at various points. Better take it anyway. I might need it. The game gives you a little free rein here to explore the town a bit more and get used to the control scheme. This initial exploration serves as a way to drive the plot forward too, as the clues you find give some indication of where you need to go next. You find a memo in a caravan that leads you to a corpse in an alleyway, which has a key to an apartment complex, thereby telling you that that is the first main section in the game. You make your way there and you are greeted by a dark, ominous, rundown building. And this is where the game starts to throw some of its narrative and gameplay intricacies at you. But first, let's talk about what your goal is here. Initially, you are tasked with finding a set of three coins that will be used to open a cabinet in one of the many rooms in the apartment complex. The actual coin puzzle itself isn't the hardest in the world, and with a bit of flexible thinking, you are likely to figure out the sequence they are meant to be placed in in a relatively short amount of time. What is confusing is honestly how you retrieve the coins as a whole. Two of the coins are your standard pickup items that you find once you've interacted with a scene or a character, but the third coin requires a small leap in logic in order for you to acquire it. You need to throw a multi-pack of juice down a garbage chute and then make your way outside to get the coin. My first time playing Playing this, I'd assume that the juice was a healing item of some kind. And so this wasn't my first solution that I thought of. It's a weird choice because most of the other puzzles aren't really as obtuse as this. They all tend to make sense on a surface level if you pay enough attention. And you'll figure out the solution to each one in pretty good time. It was just weird that you needed to drop juice down a chute. It really threw me off. Moving through the apartment complex, you stumble upon various scenes that help in further progressing the story. Much like the original Silent Hill, these are fragments of a very scattered narrative that come together towards the end. The apartment complex is filled to the brim with monsters and demons. It's worth noting that you can theoretically avoid all these monsters should you choose to switch off your torch. But this trades in your ability to see your map, so you'd have to weigh up the cost of your vision for your safety. It's a nice little element of danger, but honestly if you were to play the game carefully enough, you'd never need to make this trade. You can get through a fair few 
few of the battles with brute force, and once you get the gun, this only makes things easier. The easiest way to kill an enemy is to floor them, and then stomp on them, resulting in an instant kill. We are able to explore the narrative in whichever order we want here, so for simplicity's sake, I'll go through the events that occurred in the apartment complex as I experienced them. We first stumble upon an apartment containing a dress and a torch. The dress, if you examine it further, would look very familiar to those who scoured their inventory. If you examine the photo of Mary, you will find that the dress she is wearing is exactly as the same as the one you find. We already know from the first game that the town itself is filled with mystical energy that likes to torment its inhabitants. That is to say, the torments that happened outside of Alessa's influence on the town. And so we can infer here at first that the town is tormenting James with the memory of his wife despite him having pure intentions. After all, he just wants to see his wife again, right? As we continue to explore, we are met by an ominous figure. In the distance, we can barely make out who or what it is, but we know that they're on the other side of the bars. This is our first glimpse of Pyramid Head. He does nothing here beyond just staring at you. But in the dark, he glows red, setting him apart from the other monsters you've encountered. And when he is in the light, he does nothing but stare at you intently, his eyes locked onto you wherever you go. After playing this for the second time or beyond, it still has the potential to be extremely uncomfortable. I know I was uncomfortable despite my self-assurances that he wouldn't be able to harm me. But on your first time playing, you're almost expecting something to happen. And the fact that nothing happens is relieving at first. That is, until you discover some of the other revelations later on. You have to explore the rest of the complex in order to get to the next area, and so you go to the various floors to meet a few new characters. The first you meet is our final protagonist, Eddie. You walk into an apartment where there is a corpse being crushed by a fridge. There are bullet holes all over the walls, and this indicates that there was a struggle in the apartment that resulted in someone's death. You look around, and the sound of someone throwing up leads you to the bathroom, and this is where you meet him. Between the three of you, funnily enough, he seems the most pedestrian. He showcases some awkwardness, but he sounds no different than someone you'd find working behind the till at some corner shop. His only real off-putting behaviour in this first interaction is the fact that he's throwing up while you watch. But aside from that, he professes his innocence pretty quickly whilst urging you to stay safe. James tries to probe him for a little bit of information regarding the pyramid-headed figure standing in the hallway. However, Eddie also claims he knows nothing about it, and instead continues to throw up in the bathroom. After wishing James the best, you can leave and explore the surroundings even more. Earlier I had mentioned that the game foreshadows and tells its story in an incredibly visual fashion, and this room is the perfect example of that. I won't tell you why just yet, but I will play this a little bit so that you can take note of the various pieces on the wall, so we can come back to it later when it's finally time. You go through a little further and you come into contact with Angela once again, except this time, something seems wrong. Oh, it's you. A knife in her hand, she is laying on the ground and appears to be contemplating suicide. And James does his best to dissuade her from doing so. Angela, okay. I don't know what you're planning, but there's always another way. Really? But you're the same as me. It's easier just to run. Besides, is what we deserve. There is some paranoia on full display here where James seems to ask Angela a few questions and infer answers based on those questions. This is fine on his end, but the way Angela reacts is as if James shouldn't be privy to any of this information. There is a reasoning for this, and I can tell you now that of all the characters in the game, Angela was the one I felt the most sorry for. James manages to dissuade her by sharing a bit of information about himself. For example, the reason he came to Silent Hill. He starts to explain a situation, but this seems more like a self-imposed confirmation that what he's doing doesn't sound totally insane. He even comes out and explains that his wife is dead and that he's... Don't worry. I'm not crazy. At least, I don't think so. 
You do also get an interesting little tidbit where Angela claims that her and James are the same. And we do not know why just yet, but she seems to believe so. I had thought in this particular scene, the similarity she was pointing out was their desire to find someone they loved. For James, his wife, and for Angela, her mother. James manages to talk her off the ledge, after which Angela asks him to hold on to the knife for her, she was going to kill herself with it. Will you hold it for me? Sure. No problem. If... I kept it. I'm not sure what I might do. He approaches her to take it, but she immediately points the knife back at him. For some reason, Angela is afraid of men. She is incredibly hostile towards them and takes a combative stance whenever she is approached by one. Even if they do, on a surface level, seem as pedestrian as James is. When you find the right items, you can finally progress through the apartment complex. One place to go through is the apartment room there where you first saw Pyramid Head. And when you finally open those doors, well, you are greeted by, um, quite the image. You know, this is disturbing for a myriad of reasons. But I think what gets me the most is how heavily reliant on implication this is, and how your mind sort of fills in the blanks. There's no nudity at all, but you know exactly what's happening and that's what makes it even harder to watch. This scene was terrifying to say the least. But this is also the goal of the game, to make you uncomfortable almost entirely through the implications and suggestions that it throws at you. I mean, I can't say it wasn't successful, I mean, just look at this, can you honestly say it's not off-putting? There are a few reasons for why this is even here, in fact it connects with a lot of the elements of the story pretty cohesively, but for now this serves as a way to frame the quote-unquote antagonist of the game, and now you know he has no boundaries. James shoots at Pyramid Head without any restraint, but this seems to have no effect on him at all. And why would it? From the get-go, we already know he isn't like the others. After this scene is finally done, we can finally explore the apartments a bit more. We are able to make our way to the third floor now that we have access to the alternate staircase. Once there, there are a set of bars blocking your path, and there is a key on the other side. James reaches for it, and then... <sighs> Ow! Ha <laughs> ha! Hey, wait! Damn it! What a brat, am I right? I mean, James seems to think so too. What is this kid even doing in the town? That was one of my first thoughts, since the last time a kid was in Silent Hill, she was sacrificed to a demon to resurrect a god hell-bent on ending the world. So you'll excuse me if I have a few trust issues with the sequel. Naturally, you have to get this key before proceeding. A little exploration and some critical thinking later, you were able to do so pretty easily. I haven't brought this up just yet, but I think now is a good time. Mostly because even when I played this game this time around, the sounds in the distance, the whispers in your ear, the melancholic nature of the soundtrack overall is just masterful to say the least. Your first taste of how incredible the sound design is going to be comes from the intro itself, an introductory song that far surpasses the original. But you forgot that videotape we made. I wonder if it's still there. How do you know about that? Aren't you Maria? And would you believe that there's an alternate version of this used in the original trailers? It has this epic guitar solo that just elevates the entire song to legendary status. Sadly, Akira Yamaoka probably has all this stored solely on a hard drive somewhere, and so we'll never be able to see the original cut in its cleanest form. Enough fanboying though. The reason I bring this up is because of the whispers that had me terrified when I heard them. Of 
The issue here though is that the whispers are a little obscured. There is no clear phrasing that you would be able to take away from this. Scouring Reddit, I had found a few people who tried to decipher what was being said, and there was never any real clear answer. One thing they all seem to agree on, however, is that in some way, shape or form, the whispers are meant to foreshadow some heavy hitting revelations later on. But it, like the rest of the sound design, succeeds in creating a very eerie ambience. Your skin crawls with every room you walk into, and with the sounds of the various monsters echoing in the distance, and your radio going crazy help intensify the sense of danger. Speaking of sound, this game also knows when to use silence to great effect. There are moments in this game that are designed to be complete fake outs, and yet they are able to leave you on edge because of how much is happening in this game. The jump scares, the few that there are, are timed perfectly, with silence being the main tool hitting you with this tactic. It's a stark contrast from most horror games of this nature, as usually some sound is going on in the background before the jump scares hit you. Making your way through the second set of apartments, you finally make it to your first boss encounter. You walk into what looks to be an emergency exit so you can get to the other side of the town, and as expected, Pyramid Head is doing things. He notices you walk in immediately. He brandishes his knife and he gets ready to attack you. The boss fights in this game aren't all that notable if I'm honest. The vast majority of them involve sneaking up from behind or outlasting your opponent long enough for them to start to lose interest in you. This of course is a staple in most horror games and I understand that combat isn't the focus, but playing something as visceral as Silent Hill 2 only served to highlight this fact further. Something I would have liked honestly is for the boss battles here to involve some sort of weakness. A manual aim mode perhaps that had you focus on specific areas of Pyramid Head, and actually being able to push him back or hurt him a little in some way. But I think the purpose of the boss fight here is to show you how powerless James really is. That Pyramid Head is invincible and will continue to torment him for as long as he remains in the town. And so from a symbolic perspective, the mechanics of the boss fight make a little more sense. It is worth noting here though that you have to be kinda careful. This is a very enclosed space and Pyramid Head can, most of the time, kill you in one shot. And this can be frustrating because the game doesn't spawn you in the fight with every death. It spawns you at a later save point which, if far away, can create a bit of busy work. Pyramid Head loses interest eventually and starts to submerge himself in a mysterious liquid as he goes downstairs. The liquid then drains and it's finally time to move to the next area of the game. Walking through the streets you catch up with the girl who you met in the apartment. Weirdly, she seems unaffected by the town as a whole. You'd think of course with the monsters that are creeping around in the area that the girl would show some semblance of fear, hesitance at least, but instead she seems to be acting normal, as if nothing is going on. In this short exchange, the little girl teases James, provokes him even, stating that None of your business. You didn't love Mary anyway. Wait, how do you know Mary's name? This fills James with questions, and now his aim is to find the girl so that he can uncover more information about Mary's whereabouts. This now indicating to him that she may in fact be alive and wandering around the town, trying to find him. We wander around the town a little more and we gradually make it to a park, where a figure is waiting in the distance. Gazing at the river, she appears as though she's been waiting for someone. We make our way towards her and... Mary? No, you're not. Do I look like your girlfriend? No. This is actually Maria, and if you paid attention in the stalls at the beginning of the game, you'd find that she's actually in all the posters. Maria looks identical to Mary in almost every conceivable way, with the exception of, as James points out, You could be her twin. Your face, your voice, just your hair and clothes are different. My name is Maria. I don't look like a uh, ghost, do I? James outwardly explains to Maria why exactly he is in Silent Hill, and she does ask the obvious question about Mary being dead. I mean, who wouldn't at this point? But in probing the whole situation, Maria does ask James if the river was in fact their only special place. This prompts James to remember something else. The Lakeview Hotel also happened to be a special place that they shared. Is this your only special place? I guess. Maria scoffs and jokes about the idea, but she offers to lead him to the place. Her offer though is in the weirdest, most guilt-inducing way possible. It's better that I sort of show you. You're coming with me? You were gonna just leave me? No, but... With all these monsters around? No, I just... I'm all alone here. Everyone else is gone. 
I look like Mary, don't I? You loved her, right? <laughs> or maybe you hated her. Don't be ridiculous. So it's okay? Yeah, fine. And with that, you finally have someone to tag along with you and experience the horrors of the time together. Maria sort of acts as this foil to James' efforts, constantly providing him with an undercut to his efforts or proving that she is more resourceful than he is. It comes off as a bit of a low blow to James considering that he's looking for his wife in the first instance, and then suddenly this person who looks almost identical to her is robbing him of his victories or implying that he has ulterior motives beyond just finding his wife. It also doesn't help that she seems to act like this more sexually voracious variant of her, and this no doubt stirs something inside James within each dialogue. Our path leads us to go through some more areas of Silent Hill. Most notably here, we go through the bowling alley and a bar called Heaven's Night. The bowling alley you explore on your own because as Maria points out... I'll wait here. I hate bowling. I didn't come here to play, you know. Hurry back, okay? I'm not entirely sure how this hatred of bowling stops her from helping James find more clues, but I'm just gonna chuck this up to her playing to his inadequacies once again. The bowling alley actually opens up more questions. You walk in and you are first treated to a cutscene of the little girl and Eddie interacting. Eddie has somehow gotten a hold of some pizza, and the girl is trying to find out why Eddie is in the town. She starts to imply that you must have done something wrong in order to end up there, to which he responds, albeit in an aloof fashion, that he has done nothing wrong, saying simply that the police wouldn't understand his circumstances. Now here is where it gets tricky, because if the girl is saying that Eddie did something wrong to end up in the town, then maybe... Anyway, some dialogue during the gameplay scenes reveal that the little girl is searching for Mary, and before more can be said, James barges into the bowling alley. From here he gets the girl's name, which is Laura, and she escapes through the back door. He urges Eddie to chase after her, to which he replies, She said she was fine by herself. She said a fatso like me would just slow her down. Forget you. I don't blame James for reacting the way he did, hell, <laughs> hell, I would react the same way, but Eddie seems to show signs of inadequacy, a sort of half inferiority complex where he believes he won't actually be able to help the current situation. This is the first insight we get into his actual personality, and it's one that will be expanded upon in due time, but for now, James and Maria go after Laura, but in order to do so we have to go through Heaven's Night Bar, because the roads seem to be completely destroyed. We don't get much out of this place, aside from discovering that Maria may have worked here because she seems to have the keys to the place, the poster at the beginning seemingly indicating that she may have been a performer. They catch a glimpse of Laura going into the hospital and readily follow her inside. I assume Laura thought she might find Mary there, either way we have to brace ourselves for the horrors that follow. We go inside and we are, at first, treated to some additional notes. These notes would initially mean nothing to someone who hasn't played the first Silent Hill game, however they reference this idea of the other side, which is referenced as another layer of existence in the town. In the last game, the other side was a prominent idea, and would be revealed at any time the bell was rung, signifying a release in Alessa's powers. That the other side is mentioned in this game prepares the fully initiated for its eventual return. The problem here is that I don't believe it's as universal as it appears to be on the outset, something that can be analysed later, but a key notion to say the least. We are of course introduced to a new enemy type here, in the form of nurses that attack you with one pole. Their noises are as unsettling as you'd expect, however I think the nurses in the first game were somewhat more terrifying in that regard, their physical representation again coming off as more of a distortion of what you might experience in the real world. These enemies seem to carry a bit more detail than the others so far, specifically around the face which either seems to be completely distorted or absent completely. They are also a little tougher than the others, but again, the same tactic can be used to stump them if they hit the ground. After gathering a few of the key items, reaching a certain hospital bed has Maria ask you to slow down a little bit. She seems to be feeling a little poorly and asks you if you can let her rest in the bed for a little while. She claims this is nothing more than a hangover, but she also appears to be actively taking medication to manage her symptoms. James, being ever concerned, decides to tell her to rest, and lets Maria know that he will go out and find Laura on his own while she recovers. Did I mention the music in this place yet? Well, good god, it straight up just screams danger the moment you're near any kind of enemy. What I like about it is that it actively keeps you on your toes more than the previous area. Maria did, where previously it felt more like a mysterious exploration, here, because Maria is sick, the game makes it feel more like a race against the clock. Find Laura and help Maria. These are your goals and the game is not fucking around. Your goal now is to find a specific set of items that you can use to access another item that is lingering at the bottom of a drain. These items comprise of, oddly enough, a bunch of keys, a strand of hair, human hair I assume, and a clip that can be used as a hook. 
I at no point said that the item combinations make sense, after all the game is looking to be obtuse on purpose, but isn't that much of a leap in logic to put two and two together and know that hair can be used in conjunction with the clip, since it basically acts as a replacement for a string. You can't access the chest that contains the hair immediately though, some further exploration is needed and of course, the game just told you where to go. You make it to the roof and if you wander around long enough… <laughs> I mean hey, at least he was considerate enough to hit you with the blunt side of his cleaver this time, giving you the smallest of chances to survive. You are brought to the third floor area and surrounded by padded cells, and you can find the code to the chest at last. The last strand of hair is finally yours. Pat yourself on the back now, cause trust me, achievements like this are few and far between. You go back to the bathroom and fish out the item in the drain. An elevator key by the way. And now you can explore the places that were previously locked off in the hospital. For example, the first floor bed areas. It is here that you can finally find Laura, who for some reason seems less disturbed by the going ons of the town than our other characters do. Laura? Hell, she even has time to play with teddy bears, indicating she really isn't bothered by the town's monsters. Is she really that brave? Um, anyway, James tries to probe her for information about Mary, where she reveals that she was friends with her. She supposedly met Mary at the hospital a year ago, to which James responds, you liar! Laura, I- James at this point is pretty sure that Mary died long before last year, which now starts to raise more questions about what the hell is going on in the town. Surely James couldn't be lying about Mary's death, I thought. Maybe the lady that Laura knows was actually Maria, I thought to myself. I was here looking for more rational explanations for what I just heard, but naturally, we know that this is not the case. We are literally in a town where everything is in a state of decay or distortion, and so attaching logic shouldn't have been my go-to tactic. James convinces Laura to leave with him, but she immediately seems to remember that she left something in another room, a supposed letter from Mary that she wants to give to James. Given that he is looking for every conceivable clue about Mary's whereabouts, it makes sense that James would be looking for this letter too. But of course… Open the door, Laura. Want me to open it? Huh? Huh? Do ya? What's the magic word? Laura? Okay. I guess I won't open it. I think I'll just leave you like this. You snotty little brat! Open up! Why? You. Like I said before, the boss fights in this game are probably the weakest aspect. There isn't much here that makes them more interesting either. I mean sure, you could argue that there's some semblance of verticality here, or maybe that you have to move much faster or something. But then again, if you have a shotgun, this fight will be over in no longer than 3 minutes. Once this is over, you hear an all too familiar sound, and with it, we are brought into some familiar territory. The hospital changes, it is covered in rust, and we are back in the other world of Silent Hill. If the town wasn't already distorted enough, it just got worse. The enemies themselves seem to be covered in more layers of rust and blood, actively showing signs of further decay and becoming far more aggressive. A terrifying concept to handle as you have to lurk around all corners to try and find an escape. Your new goal is to escape the hospital. Laura is gone after all. More than likely she has already left the place, so you need to reunite with Maria and get the hell out. A note from earlier suggests that one of the rings that you need to escape could be in the basement, so naturally your first instinct is to go there, but not before the note itself causes a bit of trepidation on your part. You walk in slowly and suddenly the sound of a baby can be heard in the background. And whilst this wouldn't be unsettling normally, this combined with the patient in the note saying I will never go back there is enough to make you pick up the pace. Once you reach the bottom of the stairs, she returns. Maria. She seems to be feeling a lot better, but… Oh, Maria. It's you. I thought you were… sorry. Anyway, I'm glad you're alive. Anyway? What do you mean, anyway? You don't sound very happy to see me. I was almost killed back there. Why didn't you try to save me? All you care about is that dead wife of yours. I've never been so scared in my whole life. She's unhappy with the way James left her and didn't come back. I have to know her that this scene is one of the examples I think of when I compare the original voice actors to the HD remaster ones. Sure, the ones in the HD remaster do a decent job, but scenes like this that are meant to sound aggressive come off as flat and stiff to say the least. Anyway, I'm glad you're alive. 
Anyway? What do you mean, anyway? You don't sound very happy to see me. I was almost killed back there. Why didn't you try to save me? All you care about is that dead wife of yours. I've never been so scared in my whole life. No, James physically I... reassures Maria her, showing further the vulnerability she appears to bring out in him due to her resemblance to his late wife. She goes on to say that she has an unexplained desire to protect and look for Laura, and this is why they must find her as soon as they can. Despite the way the scene looked and the way Maria just came across, the game suddenly flips the way she acts into a more demeaning manner, where she now takes every chance possible in order to emasculate James' efforts to make progress throughout the hospital. For example, the part with the fridge. If you go there before reuniting with Maria, you'll find that James is unable to open it. If you go there again, this time with Maria, she will say, You're supposed to be the big man around here. How's a little girl like me supposed to help? Putting him down at every turn, this feels more intentional given the obvious mirrors between her and Mary, and you'll see later on what I'm referring to once I reach it, but for now, let's continue. There is a bit of a strange section here. If you go into the elevator once you find Maria, a game show host, very intense one might I add, will start to quiz you on the various happenings throughout the town. Funnily enough, whilst we as the players thought it was a little weird, the characters too appear to be confused by what happened, with Maria even trying to probe the situation. What was A little fourth wall breaking to be sure, but this also serves the purpose of trying to give you an advantage that you will need to earn instead of being just given. If you answer all of the questions correctly, then you will obtain a cluster of helpful items, do the opposite, and a swarm of enemies will rain down on you. It's worth noting that this is entirely optional though, and you can still progress with the story without answering the questions. But let's be honest, you are going to. The promise of ammo and ampules is just too big an opportunity to pass up. Finally, you manage to make your grand escape through a basement tunnel within the hospital, but not before another confrontation with the one, the only, Pyramid Head. He is relentless in his pursuits and the first time I played this, I had had enough of his shit, and I pulled out my gun and I had shot him with everything I had, avoiding his jabs as he slowed down with each shot. I may have succeeded, but the problem is that Maria is also vulnerable to damage, and so firing a gun may stave him off of you, but if he hits her, that's mission failed. So that leaves you with one final choice. Run to the other side and hope to make it on time as he speeds up his advances. You run and you run and you finally make it to the elevator. Unfortunately, Maria is a hair too late. And... Open up! And the mirroring continues. Maria is killed by Pyramid Head, and James is powerless to stop it. This reflects the way he felt when the disease was ravishing Mary and now, witnessing a woman who was the spitting image of his wife be taken down by something beyond his control. It puts him in that mindset once more, ready to quit, finding Mary is now the only purpose he has left. And so we press on. Melancholic music begins to play as the audio represents what James is starting to feel, as he sits in the elevator, reflecting on what happened. A truly somber moment. From here, you can finally make your exit. You make it to the office that has a key and a map, directing you to the next area. Just then, we notice Laura walking out, once again unfazed by all that is happening. Naturally, we follow. We made a promise after all. As we leave, James further reflects on what's happened, wallowing in his failures further, wondering if Mary is even in the town. But just then, there is a small piece of dialogue. Moving forward, we get a further taste of the claustrophobia in the form of a darkened variation of the town. Technically, we haven't left the Otherworld section, and so the developers had decided to further enhance the feeling of being lost by making the town pitch black. Once again, a technique borrowed from the previous entry, but effective nonetheless. Funnily enough, this throws off your orientation far more than the previous game. I remember playing this for the first time, and despite consulting my map multiple times, I was lost. Our new objective is to make it to the Silent Hill Historical Society, but not before obtaining a key to unlock the doors. For this, we must obtain a wrench that can be used to open a hatch near a statue in the Silent Hills Park. The wrench, of course, is used as another opportunity to deeply disturb you, because next to it, there is a letter directly addressed to James. We don't know who left it there, we have no idea how it even got there, 
but we do know that something or someone seems to be watching what he is doing. I wonder of course if this is one of the many monsters that left it in the town there, seeking to torment him further, but most also believe that a character in the side chapter, born from a wish, was also responsible for leaving the letter. Either way, you feel eyes on you more than ever after this moment and you want to do everything you can to break that line of sight. So you get the key and book it to the historical society. Upon entry, you notice a painting that looks awfully familiar. You ask yourself, is that him? James of course confirms this and now you have more questions than answers. If this painting is symbolic of judgement within the town, then what is it that James is being judged for? We don't know just yet but we're gonna find out. A noise in the distance calls out to you and now, you make your way down what seems to be an endless flight of stairs. It's time to solve the mysteries of this game. It all begins here. The staircase appears to lead to a prison underground complex, and we see more of how Silent Hill likes to mess with the reality here. For starters, the prison complex is situated underground of all places, and if this wasn't reality shifting then the implications alone are pretty dark. Secondly, there are holes everywhere in this place, holes that you have to jump down in order to progress further in the game. So not only are you going even further underground, not only does this prison complex have multiple layers of existence, but James' mindset is so beyond wreck right now that he's perfectly fine jumping down these holes. For all he knows, he could be jumping into some spikes, but he doesn't doesn't care, Mary is his only goal, so here we go. The first hole we jump down sends us into a well with seemingly no way out, but examine the walls enough and you'll find that there is a section that if you hit hard enough, you can destroy, pushing further into the complex. As with the rest of the game, keys must be found to progress, and the first key is found in a completely dark room. When you pick up the key, the light goes out, and once you replace the battery and manage to switch it back on, the room is filled with cockroaches. This is actually really unsettling. Firstly, cockroaches are beyond freaky, and secondly, it makes you sort of feel itchy all over. Just the idea of something possibly crawling all over your body in such high numbers is an idea that doesn't sit well with anybody to begin with, and so I found myself scurrying to solve the code and get out of the room. Despite the hints, for some reason this took me some time, but I made it out eventually despite almost being nibbled to death. James jumps down another gate looking hole, and at the bottom, we see a familiar face. Killing a person ain't no big deal. Just put the gun to their head, pow. We have no doubt here that Eddie is also experiencing the horrors of Silent Hill, but it seems that James carries the necessary mental and moral fortitude not to be completely broken by it just yet. Eddie on the other hand is slowly descending into madness. It is belief now that killing someone is not at all a big deal, and that doing it out of spite for how someone looks at you is perfectly plausible in this world. Part of his past spills out here, with him alluding to the fact that he has possibly done this before, and that his victim may have been a human, or may have been a dog. Remember how I said he seemed the most pedestrian earlier? This was the moment that made me begin to think otherwise. Otherwise. He insists to James that he was just joking, insisting that the corpse was on the floor before he had even arrived. He says he will be fine on his own, but naturally we are concerned for his sanity even more now. I gotta run! You're going out there alone? Yeah. Eddie! Would you believe now that the goal is to go even further underground? The fact is though, it all holds meaning. As we descend into the lower levels of Silent Hill, we get insight into the mental states of our characters, with each layer of the town revealing something new, something twisted, and something that will no doubt stick with you for quite some time. There are a large number of scares here, and a lot of it can be attributed to how the game is presented on the outset. Thanks to its atmosphere that is created masterfully, you are almost constantly anticipating something around each corner, but in saying that, because of its obtuse nature, you aren't exactly sure what you should be expecting. After all, it's led you down false scares before, and surely the prison might do the same. Exploring the complex reveals that it's divided into two sections. The bridge for this is a hallway that on each side houses prison cells. Through each hallway, you will hear footsteps. A monster seems to be lurking around, repeating one word constantly. Ritual. I mean, for me at least, it feels more like an Easter egg aimed at Silent Hill 1 fan, referencing the ritual that was used on Alessa to resurrect the god that the cult was so intent on believing in. Playing the audio backwards, however, changes the phrase completely, sounding almost like... Are you sure? Am I sure I want to progress? Yes, I am, but this isn't exactly what it's referring to. I think honestly that this is a knock at James mostly. His inability to save Maria was no doubt the result of his own physical weaknesses, but as we learn later on, he has made some choices of his own, and perhaps Maria's death, for the town at least, was a way to spotlight the decisions a bit more here. Another thing that caught me by surprise wasn't even anything to do with the plot. It's just there to scare you for no reason while you're wandering through the building and just so happen to enter a toilet. 
I knew once I heard this I had to piece the fuck out. There's no way I was staying there. The goal here is to obtain items that you can use to craft a handle for a latch on the ground. These are the wax doll, the horseshoe and the lighter. Yes, obtuse again. But it really isn't the biggest leap in logic ever. The wax doll and the lighter can be found through a simple exploration, but the horseshoe you'll need to get into a bit more puzzle solving than that. You'll find that there is a hangman's noose in one of the areas of the prison. To activate its mechanism, you need to insert three tablets into its base. The oppressor, the seductress, and the gluttonous pig. It isn't at all difficult to make the necessary connections here. Three tablets, three characters, affected by the town. Raising further questions now about our protagonist, we now know that they are all in the town for a reason. I think what's interesting to know however is where each tablet is found, because I think it acts as a tie-in and a further clue as to what each of our characters is like or what brought them here. Symbolic of James, it is found in a prison. This of course is a representation of James' mental state. On a whim he has decided to come to Silent Hill in search of someone he was sure has died. With nothing else to do in life, he is unable to move past what has happened and is so imprisoned, trapped and not able to move forward with his life. We have hints at what happened to Angela, but I cannot necessarily tell you until something else happens. However, the tablet is found in the shower and psychologically this ties into an element of our past. Frankly, it is heartbreaking. Eddie has already made no secret of his history of being bullied and picked on, however how he chose to cope was something else. The tablet was found in a dining hall, showcasing an eating disorder that he no doubt developed in order to cope with what was happening. Hell, this is given further proof earlier when Laura runs from the bowling alley where he chooses to prioritise pizza over her safety. With these items you can finally head back to the hangman's noose. If you listen carefully you can hear the sounds of horses running. I'm not entirely sure what the significance of this is, but even so, the fact that all you hear is essentially footsteps once again creates the feeling that you are not alone in this area. You make it to the noose and put the tablets in the appropriate places. With that, the mechanism is activated and the sound of a man in pain as his neck snaps is heard. Oh! That was a dirty move game. With all of the items in hand, you can finally make it to the somehow lower areas of the prison complex. You use the wax, the lighter and the horseshoe to create the handle to use on the hatch. And now you need to jump down yet another couple of holes to get to where you need to go. Silent Hill's entire structure at this point makes absolutely no sense, and the way reality is currently being warped can only be a sign of things to come. You make it through to a morgue where James seems to hallucinate that the corpses are moving. I didn't see it personally, I mean not even in the slightest of twitches, so maybe it was just you James. Although I admit his constant insistence of having seen something made me think twice about the room I was in. We leave and we continue dropping down holes. What I found kind of funny here is that even James is kind of sick of it at this point. He even goes on to think, do I really have to? And look, I know, this even leads to you having to then go down a friggin' elevator. But there is some definite symbolism to be considered here. We descend lower and lower because now, we're getting to the darker, to the root of James, and perhaps some revelations about him, or another character, will finally hit us here. The deeper we go, the darker everything gets. We are in for the long ride here and the game knows it. We make it now to a series of corridors which on a surface level harbour nothing more than a series of monsters that we've become all too familiar with already. But in order for us to make it any further in the game, we need to make it across a certain gap in the area. This means descending even lower and, well... He is relentless and he is carrying a spear yet again so that he can do his damnedest to take your life. You aren't a match for him, so it's better that you run to the other ladder as soon as possible. What's fun here though is that you kind of have the option to make it to his private room. The whole room bears resemblance to the painting we saw earlier, and so now we know this to be his base or his origin point. His knife is stored here and you can take it with you as an additional weapon to carry around. But using it isn't at all practical. The friggin thing weighs a ton and getting James to swing it is cumbersome to say the least. However, if you do manage to land a hit on anything with it, you'll find that it's incredibly powerful, mowing down most of your enemies in one shot. A fleshy undersection and a relatively weird puzzle later. I mean, just look at this cube, it's really strange. We finally make it to where we need to be. Questions flood your mind even more. First of all, how is Maria even alive? We watched her die, she was stabbed, brutally killed by Pyramid Head. James is just as dumbfounded as we are and he does all he can to remind her of what happened. Mentioning the corridor, the elevator, Pyramid Head and what he did to her. But Maria just nods this off as if nothing happened. As if she has been there, in the prison cell, just waiting for James to show up. And then... And then... James, what are you talking about? Just before! Don't you remember? James, honey, did something happen to you? After we got separated in that long hallway? Are you confusing me with someone else? 
You were always so forgetful. Remember that time in the hotel? Maria? You said you took everything. But you forgot that videotape we made. I wonder if it's still there. How do you know about that? Aren't you Maria? I'm not your Mary. So, you're Maria? I am. If you want me to be. All I want from you is an answer. It doesn't matter who I am. I'm here for you, James. See? I'm real. What is she talking about? Why is her intonation changed so much so as to sound concerned, sweet, so calm? This is a far cry from the Maria we've come to know, and even worse, she starts saying things that only James' wife Mary could have possibly known. Talking about that videotape as if she was there for the recording. Is Mary, is Maria, I, god damn this game. I love and hate this feeling of confusion because on one end, the mystery has just gotten more and more enthralling. But it has presented me with far more questions than answers at this point. And my first time playing, I couldn't make heads or tails of any of what this was, what Maria was even doing. Hell, at this point, I was only certain of one thing. And that was, to some extent, she was trying to seduce him. Maria asks James if he wants to touch her, and his answer is this reluctant but not so vocal yes. And so now we're tasked with finding a way into that cell. Weirdly, there is some cabling blocking the entrance to the place, so we have to go for a little hunt for some wire clippers. We find them and we make it to the underground and off to the next area where our next character is finally contextualized. A familiar voice, Angela seems to be breaking down in the other room, where Jane storms in to rescue her. What we get here is a glimpse into what the town is showing to her, and so the visions of both James and Angela have begun to overlap, with Angela's of course being the most prominent. Interviews with the developers have indicated however that what we see through James is relatively tame compared to what Angela is seeing. This makes her story all the more horrific, cause now I'm left wondering, what does the monster look like to her? This monster from a fighting perspective isn't all that hard, but when it grabs you it almost tries to eat you, causing a large amount of damage. But stay on your toes and you can make it through. Are you okay? What you think happened to Angela is in fact what happened. As a child and well into her teens, she was abused physically, emotionally, and sexually. It's a difficult subject to tackle, but what I think is most extraordinary about this game is how maturely they appear to have handled it, using an approach where much is implied and spoken about, but never directly shown. Relying on Angela's emotional outbursts, her personality, and overall body language to properly convey what she has gone through. If we examine the room further, we can see a few more details that allude to the concept a little further. The monster, for example, Example, though hard to see at first, resembles a figure mounting over another, with the figure below having their head tilted back, acting as the physical representation of this trauma. There are holes in the walls that have pistons going in and out, which in turn are the representation of the act itself, and the TV static which is no doubt used as a cover up for the pleas of help that Angela would have no doubt screamed for. You kill the monster and Angela, in an absolute fit of rage, beats the monster relentlessly, going as far as to even drop a TV straight onto it, killing it permanently. She falls to the ground in tears and James attempts to reassure her, but she is having none of that. Her fear and disdain of men is especially prevalent here in what she says to him, accusing him of wanting something else from her, and stating that You're trying to be nice to me, right? I know what you're up to. It's always the same. You're only after one thing. No. That's not true at all. You don't have to lie. Go ahead and say it. Or you could just force me. Beat me up like he always did. You only care about yourself anyway. You disgusting pig. Angela makes further accusations towards James, stating that his wife died because of him, that he found someone else and he didn't want her around anymore, that he is most likely the one who got rid of her. She was ill. Liar! I know 
about you. You didn't want her around anymore. You probably found someone else. <sighs> she storms out of the room and James mutters to himself that the notion is ridiculous and that he would never do something like that. With that behind us, we move on to the next area where we have to solve another puzzle in order to get the key that unlocks the valve. That needs turning. Okay, I admit, I, I, I wrote that to be quite a chain of thought. The whole idea behind this puzzle is to pull a noose belonging to the corpse that is considered innocent, thereby removing their body from the rest and giving access to the items you need to progress. The clues are given in the form of poetry written on signs, and the answer, of course, varies based on difficulty. The most immediate hint of who is innocent is based on the corpses that have blood, and those that don't. This not only acts as an effective clue to help you solve the puzzle, but it also tells you that those who end up punished in Silent Hill are those with blood on their hands. The valve turned, we make it to the prison cell, but what we find is... Maria? Maria? Maria, no! What happened to you? Why? Why? James is distraught and without word, uttering not but the name Mary. He likens this to his failure over his late wife. No doubt the situation and even the positioning of Maria's body had mirrored his late wife's directly, and so he sees nothing more than the sum of his failures when looking down at Maria. We leave this room and we are brought to a graveyard scene, which to me is one of the eeriest parts of the game. It's not only that you are basically surrounded by corpses here, but it's that the three main graves that you notice are actually engraved with names. Our three lead characters all share something in common that brought them into the town, and if you have been paying attention, the name engraved on the other grave will tell you exactly what that is. This is the name of a famous serial killer who kidnapped and murdered children in Silent Hill. Yeah, I know, really dark, but we are dealing with horror. With him being lumped together with our three main protagonists, this acts as confirmation that perhaps none of them are innocent as they appear. That the town isn't solely responsible for bringing out their darker sides. That their past were the precise reason. Silent Hill acting instead as a reminder, a proxy for their punishments. A quick side note, with Angela's second name finally confirmed, we can refer back to an article that was found before we saved her. This article states that the bodies of two men, her father and brother, were found with multiple stab wounds, and that the house was set ablaze by unknown causes. Angela being responsible for the murder of these two, she more than likely fled from the scene and found her way into the town, where she is now looking for her mother. The grave for James is open, and now we are tasked with jumping down. We enter the grave and we arrive in a narrow hallway, leading to a freezer room, where we meet... Eddie, what are you doing? What does it look like? He always busted my balls. You fat, disgusting piece of shit. You make me sick. Fat ass, you're nothing but a waste of skin. You're so ugly, even your mama don't love you. Well, maybe he was right. Maybe I am nothing but a fat, disgusting piece of shit. But you know what? It doesn't matter if you're smart, dumb, ugly, pretty. It's all the same once you're dead. And the corpse can't laugh. From now on, if anyone makes fun of me, I'll kill him. Just like that. He has really gone off the deep end. It's worth noting here that in a weird twist, he hasn't actually killed anyone since coming to the town. He was technically telling the truth, since the figures that appear in Silent Hill are nothing more than apparitions, created by the town for the express purpose of torment. However, his entire backstory here is revealed to be a consequence of years of bullying and physical abuse from his peers. Frequently labelled ugly and worthless by those around him, he quickly accuses James of being the same as the others, interestingly the same way Angela also accused him, and turns against him. What comes is a boss fight where he continues to reveal more information about himself, and through this we learn that his main bully had actually continued to torment him into his adulthood, and as a result he finally lashed out. Getting his hands on a revolver, he killed the tormentor's dog, watching it struggle to survive as it began to tear out its own insides in a bid to stop the bleeding. When the bully came out and saw, Eddie shot and permanently crippled him, 
taking away his physical superiority and ending any hopes of him playing any sports in the future as a career. It is interesting to note that a detail from very early in the game actually foreshadows exactly what Eddie did. When we meet him for the first time, we have the option to explore one of the rooms nearby which is littered with writing on the wall and drawings that indicate what he had done. This detail blew my mind. The first time I played it, I had neglected to explore the area. And now, during this slower, more analytical playthrough, I found it and was stunned by the fact that we could know what he did before he ever confessed. We have in fact overlapped into Eddie's vision of Silent Hill here too, where Angela's is reminiscent of burnt flesh, Eddie's is cold, dark, closely resembling the inside of a freezer, down to the pipes and the meat hanging from the ceiling. The meat is not identifiable and so can be considered a representation of the dog that he killed, but the shaping of the meats in this place are also reminiscent of Eddie himself and so can represent the world's perception of him. He also mentions that everything is laughing at him, everything laughs at him with their eyes and so the corpses we see on the ground are manifest stations of his past tormentors, all of them killed by his hand as he enacts his power fantasy, but ultimately leading to his mental state being permanently damaged. This boss fight isn't all that intense, in fact I had saved some shotgun shells just for this, knowing he would come in close and try to punch me this time, but I suppose symbolically this moment serves as a turning point in James's journey, looking onto a human body he is responsible for killing with remorse, regret and now ready to face the darkness that follows. I think that realizing now that he possesses the capacity to take human life, it forces him to question the nature of Mary's death. And this leads us to our final chapter in the game. We've explored Angela's story, we have explored Eddie's, but now it is time to face James. We take a small boat we can use to cross the lake. The place is covered in fog, but we can follow a light that will lead us directly to the final area, the hotel, the special place. Reluctantly, we walk in. The hotel is as dark as the rest of the areas we've explored, implying we haven't really escaped the other world yet. As we move forward, we are greeted by a familiar face. Did I scare you? Yeah, you did. <sighs> Laura. James is glad to see her safe, but she begins questioning him, asking him if he has found Mary, that she was assured that James would find her, that she was assured that James would find her, it said so in the letter that she took from the nurse's office that one day. The letter Mary wrote expresses more than anything a desire for Laura to be adopted by James, as Mary will not be able to do it when she's gone. She wrote the letter hoping to persuade Laura that James is a good person, and that she can trust him to look after her. The letter was to be given to her on her 8th birthday, and since Laura was admitted into the hospital only a year ago, the letter was written around the same time. James realises this after asking Laura her age, and starts to realise that Mary couldn't have died all those years ago. Laura mentions that Mary would talk to her about Silent Hill a lot, and that her desire was to come back to the town someday. She goes on to state that this is alluded to in another letter, that unfortunately she has dropped it somewhere, and so she hurries to go and find it. So we have a specific task here. We need to make our way to the third floor where, on the map, Mary states she is waiting. I forgot to record it, but if you go to the third floor, you'll find that there is a shutter in the way, but Mary will call out to you saying, James, I'm waiting for you here, James. What a horrible impression. Adding more to the eeriness of this entire section, and leaving you wondering more about the state of James' mind. Like the rest of the town, how you make it through the area is a bit of a confusing notion in itself. You have to do a lot of very obtuse looking puzzles in order to make it through here. They carry very little symbolism as far as the story goes, however the locations you end up in carry significance to James' character. But let's discuss how we make it to the third floor. Your goal here is to activate a music box in the main lobby room so that you can access a key that leads you there. This box makes use of statues that are inspired by fairy tales, and where they are found are obvious links to the obvious elements in their stories. The Little Mermaid found near the lake, Snow White found near apples, Cinderella found in a suitcase. Both the Little Mermaid and the Cinderella ones require very little effort to acquire. It's the Snow White one that's kind of a terrifying experience. In order to obtain it, you need to make your way to an employee elevator, which will lead you to the staff area that houses the statue in question. When you get into the elevator, it beeps loudly at first, and then when you read the sign, it says, I ran straight out. Who on earth was in that elevator with me? I hadn't been so freaked out in the game till now because one, it's an enclosed area. If those doors are closed, then you'd be pretty easy enough to kill. And two, your experience with elevators has already been horrifying enough. Thankfully though, the only reason this went off was because of your inventory. You just needed to store it in the cupboard nearby and then use the elevator. This of course stops you from being able to defend yourself and so you need to be sure to take extra care when navigating the area. The enemies aren't too aggressive here, especially since they mostly react to light and you're no longer 
longer a light source. They only really start to attack you if you make physical contact, or if you rush through the place like I did. Sue me, I was eager for my weapons, can you really blame me? Navigating through, you manage to make it to a bar inside the hotel, which carries significance to James. It was one of the many places where he and Mary would spend their time together while staying in Silent Hill. He recalls having some good memories here, remembering sharing drinks and having a fancy meal, and overall just having a good time. His memories of her are fond right? You can get your things back, but not before trying to bypass a load of enemies. You manage to push through and after getting your weapons back, you are ready to exact revenge, except... Not even gonna lie, this hurt my pride just a little. You manage to make it out of her, and you solve the puzzle of the music box. And after picking up the keys and reading the note left by the hotel, you are finally ready to confront Mary. You gradually make your way to the special room, you turn the key and… It's empty. All that remains is the bed, the sofas and the TV. The VHS player on the ground seems to be working, and so the videotape you left in your room, you can use it, and at long last, the penny drops. Are you taping again? Come on. I don't know why, but I just love it here. It's so peaceful. You know what I heard? This whole area used to be a sacred place. I think I can see why. It's too bad we have to leave. Please promise you'll take me again, James. <laughs> From what I can tell, James seems to have entered a state of self-imposed amnesia. His psyche was unable to process the fact that he killed his wife, despite it being his own decision. The mislead here is masterful if you are the one playing it, because even if you are given these hints, the ones that I noticed at least, part of you will always want to believe that you are playing the role of the good guy. But once this twist finally hits, a bunch of pieces start to fall into place. And it's quite an amazing eureka moment. The kind of aha that made me feel a little mad, confused, yet proud of the revelations that hit me. For starters, we look at Pyramid Head. We know now that he is there to punish James by reminding him of his past sins, desires and the impulses that he neglected for so long. I looked back in that moment and realised that Pyramid Head is in fact the mirror image of James Sunderland. Many of the things he did, many of the things he represented, either visually or metaphorically represented James' repressed memories. Maria's deaths, Pyramid Head was responsible for the first death and most likely responsible for the second. Pyramid Head killing Maria is a mirror of James killing Mary. Pyramid Head's more sexual desires, the representation of all the frustration built up inside of James, and shown in the behaviour that Pyramid had had no shame in exhibiting. His appearance, he was brought into existence by the town's desire to judge and punish James. He was the bad guy this whole time, and now we know why Pyramid Head is after him to begin with. James being unable to kill him, it's natural indeed that you try to fight back against him.
him, given his self-imposed amnesia, but the notes of his character go even deeper the more that we think about it. Since the whole ordeal was a representation of his other world, then this indeed extends to the monsters too. The abstract daddy, which originally represented an extension of Angela's nightmare, that James could see it meant that it represented something to him too, which from my perspective is the act of suffocation, smothering his wife with a pillow until she stopped breathing. The nurses themselves are sexual representations to James, a desire that he would have had during his wife's time in the hospital, but the nurses also have defamations on their faces, swollen areas, which I think represented Mary's own illness. The flesh lip is a far more vivid representation of what was happening to Mary, showcasing her inability to move, to communicate effectively towards the end of her life. The fact that they are encased shows how trapped she was in her own physical circumstances. The lying figure, the most vivid representation of Mary's whole circumstance, from its movements down to the way it attacks. In every conceivable way, it not only represents Mary as a person, but also her relationship with James during her time at the hospital, and their physical appearance indicative of distortion and disfigurement, representing how Mary appeared towards the end of her life. Their attack being acid that they shoot from their mouths, indicating vomiting. Their arms being restricted, representing how Mary was confined and unable to be physically close to James. This monster is also the one that is assaulted most by Pyramid Head. As we established before, he is a mirror to James, and so these assaults are a representation of James' own aggression towards Mary or towards her own illness. The mandarins, the monsters under the gate, is a representation of James' memory repression. That they can never make it to the surface is indicative of this. There are times when they fall too, which shows James' own self-imposed amnesia. And the mannequins, the first of the monsters we see being assaulted by Pyramid Head, is a direct representation of the sexual frustration felt by James. The abuse they suffer as well as a direct call to the time spent at the prison, where the word oppressor is used to describe James, with Pyramid Head backing this up as his mirror. Right, I just unloaded a lot. But it also makes sense that of all the characters we get insight on, it would be James since he is our lens into the town. His nightmares are the ones we experience most fully, and so he would naturally be the most contextualized of all of them. James, realizing the truth, looks down in shame knowing what he has done. In this moment, he knows he will never find Mary. She has gone from this world and Silent Hill brought him here to remind him of his sins. Laura rushes in and asks James if he found Mary, to which he replies, Mary's gone. She's dead. Liar, that's a lie! No, that's not true. She... she died because she was sick? No, I killed her. Naturally, Laura is distraught by this, and so demands that he brings her back. She never had the chance to grieve over Mary, and so now she is bargaining, thinking that James can do something to bring her back despite having killed her. After saying this, she storms out of the room. James apologizes, but he knows it's pointless to do so. He sits for a little longer, but just as he is wallowing in his shame, the radio flicks on. Remember at the beginning, we had a similar message come through the radio, but it was heavily filtered, and we were unable to make out what was being said. This time it is complete, and now that we know Mary is dead, it can only be one other person, Maria. She was responsible for luring you around the town this whole time, giving you hope that Mary could be alive. As you leave the room, the hotel itself starts to enter a state of distortion and degradation. If the hotel represented the summary of James and Mary's relationship, and the time that they spent together, and that this is now confirmed to be coming to an end, so too is James's image of this special place. Furthermore, the pathway to leave is somewhat scattered, representing his current emotional turmoil and his complete loss of purpose. It does sort of make it a bit annoying to navigate, but I liken it to the nowhere sections of Silent Hill one, a collection of memories that are just completely shattered. If we manage to make it to the office nearby, we can interact with a radio which will further contextualize James' confusion. Mary's going to die? You, you must be joking. Must be joking. I'm very sorry. But you're a doctor. It's your job to heal people. 
How can you just let her die? Please, calm down. As her doctor, I promise I'll do what I can, but there's still no effective treatment for her condition. How long does she have? I'm afraid I'm not sure. Three years at most, perhaps six months. It's impossible to say with certainty. Three years ago, Mary didn't die, but James did find out about the illness that was going to kill her in the long term. To him, it is likely that his purpose, his relationship, died the day he discovered this. Moving on from this, we now get to finish one final character arc before we reach the end. We stumble upon a staircase that is engulfed in flames, and we see a familiar face. Angela has become consumed by the illusions here, mistaking James for her mother, stating she is the only one left and that once she is done, she can finally get some rest. Eventually, she does snap out of it, realizing that it's actually James that she's seeing. What follows is probably the scene that broke my heart most while playing this game. Maybe it's just better that I show you. You're not my mama. It's it's you. Oh, I, I I'm sorry. Angela, no. Thank you for saving me. But I wish you hadn't. Even Mama said it. I deserved what happened. No, Angela, that's wrong. Angela is, and always has been, convinced that what happened to her was entirely her fault. Which makes this especially heartbreaking when contextually, we understand what drove her to commit the crimes that she did. Years of abuse weighed down on her and she snapped. And now, when she faces herself, when she sees what she has done, she sees nothing of worth. I cannot comment with any authority what all this means from a psychological perspective, but through sympathy we understand why she is the way she is. We also understand that her circumstances have made vast changes to her personality, and as a result we are repelled by the way she speaks. We as the audience question whether we would help her. Would our answers to her questions be a resounding yes, or would we stay silent like James did? It is handled incredibly maturely without resorting to vivid flashbacks, done through dialogue, suggestion and implication. I praise the game immensely for it. Telling James she wants the knife back, we assume that she is looking to end her life, but at the very least, James refrains from returning it, preventing Angela from fully going through with it. James comments as she walks away that it's hot as hell in the room, to which Angela replies, You see it too. For me, it's always like this. We see her disappear into the flames and her fate is left completely ambiguous. We don't know if she survived the events of this game or if she continued to walk endlessly through the flames. A quick side note here, Angela's world seems to have these sculptures, for lack of a better term, which are reminiscent of two male bodies with the genitals removed, which are representations of her father and brother as well as the hostility she would have felt towards them after what they had done. As we progress, our goal is now to make it to the top floor of the apartment complex, where we know that Maria is waiting. Our final save point is on the way and this has nine squares, symbolic of the monsters we came across throughout the game. We have dealt with them at long last, and now there is only one left. We make it to what we thought was the top, and we see Maria bound up with one pyramid head on either side of her. They torment him one last time by killing Maria right before his eyes. James pleads with them to stop, to spare her, but they don't. James drops to his knees, but he begins to realize that perhaps Pyramid Head was a creation of his own. That he willed it into existence because he, on a subconscious level, wanted to be judged for what he did. He was too weak to do it himself, and so Pyramid Head was given life to do it for him. With this in mind, he understands the truth now, and he's ready to bring this nightmare to an end. You might be expecting some sort of epic boss battle here, but honestly, it's the same as the last time you fought him. You need to outlast them both before they choose to kill themselves instead. Symbolically, since they are no longer needed by him, they take it upon themselves to erase themselves from existence. Each of the pyramid heads carry an egg in their possession that you need in order to make it through whichever door you choose. I'm not sure what bearing the doors have on the ending, but I know that the eggs carry symbolism of their own, which took me a while but I managed to figure it out eventually. 
Both of the eggs represented the lives that James had taken in order to bring Pyramid Head into existence. The rust-colored egg, this is a representation of Mary, who at the point of her death was suffering from an incurable disease. The rust is a manifestation of this, and so the egg represents her. The scarlet egg, this is representative of Eddie, who at the point of his death was healthy for the most part, and so the color of fresh blood is indicative of this. You get through the doors and we get one final vocal flashback with the interactions between James and Mary while she was in the hospital. Mary? What do you want, James? I, uh, I brought you some flowers. Flowers? I don't want any damn flowers. Just go home already. Mary, what are you saying? Look, I'm disgusting. I don't deserve flowers. Between the disease and the drugs, I look like a monster. Well, what are you looking at? Get the hell out of here! Leave me alone already! I'm no use to anyone. I'll be dead soon anyway. Maybe today. Maybe tomorrow. It'd be easier if they'd just kill me. But I guess the hospital's making a nice profit off me. They want to keep me alive. Are you still here? I told you to go! Are you deaf? Don't come back! James, wait, please don't go, stay with me, don't leave me alone, I didn't mean what I said, please James, tell me I'll be okay, tell me I'm not going to die, help me. You can hear the anguish in her voice, she can't really come to terms with the fact that she is going to die, and so is lashing out at James, thinking he believes that she has fallen from grace, that perfect image he saw in her before. It is a realistic way to look at it, and the kind of inferiority complex that one would develop if they were in fact degrading the same way Mary was. That this is one of the most prominent memories of her in James's mind also gives a little insight as to why he did what he did, though that could also change. For three of the four main endings, this section plays out the same to start with. For now, I'll go through the ending I got and the ending I actually think is canonical. At the top, we run into Maria, but she is dressed as Mary as a final knock against James. He says that he doesn't need her anymore, that he knows the truth and is finally ready to move on without her. Maria pleads with him. Her existence is tied to James and without him, she would fade. She would no longer be alive, after all. She was born from his desires. And with that, we enter our final boss fight. I'm gonna level with you about a few things there. First off, I had a wild theory when I first saw Maria's true form. When I played this game for the first time, I straight up assumed that it was directly linked to the first game in ways beyond just the town it took place in. Seeing Maria turn into what appeared to be someone belonging to the cult, I ended up believing at first that Maria was actually Dahlia, or some form of Dahlia that survived the events from Silent Hill 1. I had linked this together based on her appearance, but also an inherent interest in Laura. For some reason, I believed that Dahlia may have needed a replacement for what was Alessa, or that she was trying to find the child that Harry was given, that she may have thought that Laura was this child. Eventually though, as I played the game, I realised neither of these things could be true. If she did in fact suspect that Laura was the child in question, then surely she'd be aiming for Harry and not James, since he wasn't involved in any way with the first game. The second thing is the actual boss fight itself. I'd saved my rifle rounds just for this and generally it's pretty easy. Though she has the same pretty cheap tactics in the form of these JPEG moths that come and sap your health away. If you stay on your toes a little and manage to run where possible and shoot with proper timing, you'll beat her in a matter of minutes. The one tactic I wouldn't recommend is melee only. It's a bit of an exercise in masochism since you leave yourself open to attack. And she has this tentacle move that utterly ruins you if she manages to land it. What is made abundantly clear here is that the Maria Union was also created by the town for the sake of tormenting James, by giving him a more promiscuous version of his wife to fawn over, and then taking her away over and over. She too had some awareness of this given her transformation. She is the ninth and final monster, thereby completing the nine save squares you saw earlier, and with that, James has fully dealt with his past. We are given one final scene here where James can finally have some closure with Mary. She explains that all this time, she wanted to die, to which James says, That's why I did it, honey. I just couldn't watch you suffer. No. That's not true. You also said you didn't want to die. The truth is, I hated you. I wanted you out of the way. I wanted my life back. 
Through his interactions here, he comes to realize that what he did was selfish in nature, that he took the chance to take Mary's life so that he could go back to living his own, but this led him nowhere and he was brought to the town despite this. He even goes as far as to admit that he began to resent her, hate her, that he wanted out of the way so that he could finally live his life. Mary insists this cannot be true, that James' sadness is undeniable proof of him harboring no hatred towards her. I can't say I agree or disagree. I cannot say whether or not this is the truth since we can only say for sure that James' intentions were selfish. However, we can conclude here that Mary herself harbours no ill will towards him for what he did. She even states that she wants him to move on, to live his life to the fullest without her. The ending I got on my first time playing, and even this recent playthrough was called the leave ending. In it, we get a narration of Mary's final letter to James. Whilst in the background we see that he has found Laura, and together they intend to live their lives in Mary's name. The situation here mirrors the situation with Harry and Cheryl, where he was told to give the child a new life away from the cult. The narration itself is pretty emotional, and the behind the scenes trivia here is that the actress who played Mary was brought to tears while reading it. I can't blame her, the whole letter is pretty much Mary apologising for being such a burden on James, and that she was happy with him despite everything. It's bittersweet for the character knowing that she loved this man unconditionally, yet the circumstances drove him to take her life. On the other end of the spectrum, and the ending I thought was canon to the whole ordeal, is the in water ending. Here, instead of honouring Mary's request to live a life without her, he takes her body with him to the lake in Silent Hill, the other special place, and decides to drown alongside her. In his mind, this is so that they can be together forever, deciding here, of course, that life is not worth living unless Mary is part of it. Admittedly, there's only two reasons why I believe this to be the case. The first is the intro video to the game, where James is carrying Mary's body through a corridor, which directly mirrors the ending we get here. The second is a statement made in Silent Hill 4, where James is said to have disappeared into the town along with his wife. The letter read at the end of the game doesn't change regardless of the ending, and Mary's feelings remain absolute regardless of James' final actions. The endings are achieved in perhaps the greatest way possible. See, in most games with alternate endings, you are given key forks in the road to help you make that choice. Dialogues or character decisions that help influence the ending a bit more. Silent Hill 2, on the other hand, is entirely gameplay focused. Whatever ending you decide you want, your playstyle has to reflect that. In Water, for example, is based entirely on a desire to die, and so you need to be careless with the health bar, not recovering often, and examine an item or two to make the game believe this is the ending you're after. This is ingenious, and I cannot for the life of me understand why games with alternate endings don't use similar systems. There are also other endings that can be achieved on a second playthrough, but these are joke endings. I'm pretty sure there was one involving a dog that was responsible for everything in the town. Honestly, I like this. It's nice to see when a game can poke fun at itself. In all honesty, I'm not entirely sure how to round this video off. Silent Hill 2 in itself is such a monumental journey that it's difficult to sum it up even in a video like this. I can tell you without reservation that, although it isn't my favourite horror game of all time, see Fatal Frame 2, it is possibly one of my favourite narratives of all time. Silent Hill 2's story is predicated and depends on the idea of human tragedy. Where the supernatural elements do exist, they are used to help us identify and understand the greatest struggles and the very real issues each character is dealing with. The subject matters that it chooses to tackle are all very real, and these sorts of characters are no doubt a mirror to the kind of people you may have met at one point in your life. The horror of Silent Hill 2 is not all its monsters, Pyramid Head, The Fog. No, its horror lies in human emotion, trauma, guilt and depression. It dives into these subject matters unflinchingly and without reservation, ready to show you how horrifying reality can be. You'll be so enthralled even after watching this video, cause listening to me talk about it and you actually experiencing it are two entirely different things altogether. And I can promise you, once you go on that journey, you'll feel the same. Hell, you may even find details that I missed. I played as slow as I could, but the game is so dense with ideas that I cannot help but feel that I missed something, or maybe I'm overthinking the premise, that's also possible. But you owe it to yourself to try this game, to play it for yourself, for its unrelenting journey with its central protagonists. It may feel obscured at first, but I promise you, there is no game in this world quite like Silent Hill 2. I promised myself on writing this script that this would be the longest video I'd ever do. I don't know that I'll keep that promise, and I would find it hard to find something deeper and more complex narratively than this game. But that is the end of the video. Feel free to leave a comment, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe, and let me know what you think of this game. I'd love to hear it. Until then, next time.